So last week, Joe uh, began with uh, Nehemiah, go figure, uh, the 13th chapter, and he read uh, verses 1 through 4, and we talked about that. And uh, it was uh, about separating ourselves from people who are bad for us, basically. And this is what God commanded uh, the people to do is to separate themselves from the Moabites and um, the Ammonites. And so, uh, actually, if, if uh, they read, if you look at verse 1, uh, they read from the book of Moses, and they read about the history of the Ammonites and the Moabites and uh, how uh, uh, they had actually tried to put a curse on Israel and uh, so they have fought against Israel. And so now we're going to scoot down to the fifth chapter, or the fifth verse, sorry, thank you. And, uh, well, we're going to go back up to the fourth. Now, prior to this, Eliashib the priest, who was a, appointed over the chambers of the house of our God, being related to Tobiah, had prepared a large room for him, where formerly they put the grain offerings, the frankincense, the utensils, and the tithes of grain, wine, and oil prescribed for the Levites, the singers, and the gatekeepers, and the contributions for the priest. But during all this time, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had gone to the king after some time, however, I asked leave from the king, and I came to Jerusalem and learned about the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah by preparing a room for him in the courts of the house of God. It was very displeasing to me, so I threw all of Tobiah's household goods out of the room. Then I gave an order, and they cleansed the rooms, and I returned there the utensils of the house of God with the grain offerings and the frankincense. So in the first verse, we're reading about the fact that we're supposed to separate ourselves from the Ammonites and the Moabites. And here, Eliashib, who actually is not just a priest, he is the high priest, has gone directly against God's word First of all, nobody should have been in, uh, living in, in those rooms. Those rooms were dedicated to being filled with, with uh, offerings that were brought into the temple. But instead, not only did he use them as living quarters, but for somebody that specifically was not even to step foot into the temple. And so this is why, and, and what, uh, this is why uh, Nehemiah was so incensed by this and threw all of Tobiah's stuff out. So let's start with our introduction. Today we're going to take a look at Nehemiah 13, 4 through 9. We find that Nehemiah had returned to Persia, and because of a lack of leadership, the temple was being misused. We're going to take a look at how our bodies relate to the temple and how we are expected to keep the temple holy. 1 Corinthians tells us that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. It tells us that we don't belong to ourselves, but we have been purchased by the blood of Jesus. It tells us that because of this, we should honor God with our bodies. We have a tendency to think that our body belongs to us, which gives us the right to defile it. But if we realize that our bodies are not our own, but the temple of the Holy Spirit, then we will understand that keeping our bodies pure isn't an option, but a requirement by God. We are not to defile our bodies by what we put into them in the way of food or drink, but also what we expose them to physically, mentally, and spiritually. We are to keep them pure, and if we defile them, we need to purify them. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to look at, at basically the purpose of the temple. Now you think about it, and, and we're going to compare, because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, the purpose of this temple. And basically, 
the temple was created to bring people together. The temple by itself is of, of little value, but it was to bring the people to the temple so that they could have fellowship with God. And this temple was created to have fellowship with God. That's our purpose. That's our reasoning. And so um, it talks about uh, number one purpose of the temple being for the people to bring their offerings in. And uh, if actually, if you read about in Matthew 23, 23, this is Jesus speaking, and he's actually chiding the Pharisees for, uh, for doing the right things by bringing in the offerings of, of uh, grain and uh, spices and so on, but not doing other things that he should, that they should be doing. It also talks about tithing there and Jesus said that he, you should tithe so there's there's a couple of different things there we see that that uh, they're supposed to bring in the offerings they're supposed to bring in the tithes but he's saying that there's more to it than that because basically what they should be doing is offering them their themselves as an offering to the Lord in Malachi, we see, once again about tithes, that he actually, God asked, will you rob me by not bringing tithes in? Because the, uh, they're to be brought into the storehouse for the ministering of the gospel and for the maintenance of it. And then in 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about the gifts of the Spirit. Now, why did I, I put that in there? Very simple, because that is another thing that needs to be offered. See, we, we basically, God wants us to willfully bring the things that we have, the resources we have, as an offering to Him with an attitude of praise and thanksgiving. So using the gifts He's given us to serve Him and to serve others, that's an offering. See, that's, that's bring, using the temple for an offering. And when we give offerings, they're to be without spot or blemish. In other words, God doesn't want our leftovers. He wants our first fruits. He wants the best of us. His word tells us also that to whom much is given, much is required. So we're not just talking about okay, money and stuff like that. We're talking about what kind of gifts has God given us? What, what has he called us to do because he's given us gifts? And a gift needs to be given out, right? God brought it, gave us all different gifts so that we can minister to other people. It's not to keep for ourselves, but it's to give as an offering to God and to touch other people's lives. What gift has he given to you, and what is he asking you to do with it? If you don't actually have the answer to that, it would be something great for you to seek, because he, he wants us to do that. And sometimes that changes. I mean, I'm at a new season in my life where I'm still going to be using the gifts God's given me, but in a different way. And so there are different seasons. So, um, forgive me for a minute. My computer's not cooperating with me. The next thing that the temple's used for is sacrifice. And um, it tells us that we're to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, you know that they brought the sacrifices into the temple, and you guys probably understand what that is, and, and Joe recently talked about that. So I'm not going to go into that, but I want us to look at, okay, so they take sacrifices into the temple, and that's one of the things that they're supposed to do. What about us? God calls us to sacrifice. And actually, in, in uh, Romans 12, where it says we're supposed to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, it says that's our reasonable service. So it's not like, oh, yeah, uh, 
it's something that we really should do. It's something that he, he's, he expects us to do. In Galatians 5, it says that those that belong to Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And so you may say to me, you know, to sacrifice is easier said than done. To crucify the flesh is easier said than done. But you know, it wasn't easy for Jesus either. It says that he was tempted in all ways as we're tempted. And so it also says that he understands because he was tempted in all ways. And so Jesus is calling us to live sacrificial lives. He's calling us to be willing to, to give up something in order to serve him. And then it was used for praise and worship. I really enjoyed praise and worship this morning. And uh, the whole idea with praise and worship is, is that it's supposed to bring us into closer relationship with him. Carrie recently preached on that. And I love Hebrews thirteen fifteen because it says, Through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. So it's interesting because we're talking about offerings. We're offering praise. We're talking about sacrifice. We're talking about being willing to sacrifice to praise. And we're talking about praising. And it says, the fruit of our lips give thanks to his name. And it says, do not neglect doing good and sharing. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. And then John 4.23 says, But an hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father <clears throat> in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, you know, one of the things about worship is, is it doesn't just have to take place here. It can take place anywhere you are. And actually, most of you would appreciate me doing most of my worship elsewhere. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I can get in my car and I can crank up the music and I can listen to the music that I really love and really get into a time of worship. Some of you may do that in the shower or just uh, whatever, but the, the point of it is is that God wants genuine, true worship from us. And sometimes worship is more than just singing. It's, it's we worship him in, in how we love him and how we appreciate him. And as you know, praise and worship go hand in hand. And also the temple was used for reading the word. You'll notice that in Nehemiah 13, it starts out with their reading the word. And so why do you read the word? To know and understand God, to understand what he wants of us, to come closer to him. And I love Psalm 119, and it says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. With all my heart I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. Your word have I treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. The King James Version says, Your word have I hidden in my heart that I can't sin against you. So you see that what happens is, is, Reading the Word is not just so that we can hear the nice stories. Reading the Word is just so that we can take it and absorb it into our lives so that we can understand it. And, you know, the thing of it is, is if we're going someplace and we have some temptation come to us, and I'll give you a great example of that. When Jesus was tempted by the devil, what did he say? It is written right? He quoted the word to the devil, and he said, it's written. Okay, so if I'm tempted to do some kind of sin, and I don't know that it's sin, or I don't know what the word says about it, what defense do I have? Strength, my own human strength, 
it's not going to work. But if I've hidden his word in my heart, it can protect me from that. It can be the source. You know, um, my wife amazes me because uh, she has trouble retaining the word. We went to, but she reads the word, and she's been reading the word for over 40 years, and she consumes the word when she reads it. And so we went to Africa to minister. <clears throat> it was an amazing experience. We saw over 127 women commit their lives to the Lord. But I saw her going around and quoting the word, the word that she thought she couldn't remember. And so what, ha <clears throat> what happened is, is because she had studied it, God brought it to her remembrance. It was hidden in her heart. <clears throat> and so I want to encourage you to be readers of the word, to be hearers of the word, and to be doers of the word. And finally, the temple was for prayer. And God wants us to pray. First Thessalonians says, pray without ceasing. Now, and, you know, you think about that and you say, well, I've got other things to do in my life. I can't pray 24-7. Well, that's not the point. The point is, is you're walking down the street and you see some homeless person why can't you say, Lord, please bless them? Is that a prayer? Yeah. What, what's the shortest prayer in the, in the Bible? Yeah. And another very short prayer. Peter said it. Joe just referred to it, basically. Jesus, help me. And did he? What, did Jesus stop and say, hey, wait a minute, you know, that, that prayer wasn't good enough, needs to be a little more flowery, you know. No, it was a sincere prayer. We, we were miraculously spared from a car accident. We had uh, our Volkswagen bus crammed full of kids that we took from the hood that we lived in once upon a time to church. And... There really is a miracle that this car didn't hit us. And as I saw it coming towards us, I'm being real spiritual. I'm sitting there and I'm saying, it's going to hit us. This is going to hurt. <laughs> Kathy, what'd she say? One word, Jesus. And it was almost like this miraculous thing, like this big angel just reached out and stopped that car. I mean, I saw absolutely no way why it couldn't hit us. And the, there was a woman in the driver's seat. We could see her face, and it, it was, like, alarmed. And she made the sign of the cross, and they drove off. Does God answer simple prayers? Yeah. Yeah, he does. And so, um, Romans 12 says, be devoted to prayer. And the King James Version says, instant in prayer. And that's an example of that. And then uh, corporately, uh, you know, the Bible says, whenever two or more are gathered in one place, there am I in the midst. It says, when to ask that we receive. And I love God's phone number. Anybody know it? Jeremiah 33, 3. It's never busy. He says, call upon me, and I will answer you out of heaven and show you great and mighty things that you do not know. When we call upon God, he always answers. Now, I got to tell you, sometimes he doesn't answer the way we want him to. I hate the word no. Sometimes God says no. Sometimes he says, maybe. But God wants us to bring our offerings willfully and with an attitude of praise and thanksgiving. Hang on a minute, I'm getting there.
So we're going to take a look now at defiling the temple. That's, that's what had happened. That's what Nehemiah found when he came back to the temple. Now, actually, that was because of a lack of good leadership. I mean, Eliashib, the priest, was not only just not being a good leader, but he actually was defiling the temple himself. Now, Tobiah was a relative of his through marriage, but that's certainly no excuse because somebody is a relative of mine. Maybe, maybe somebody in my family marries a, a Muslim terrorist. Does that mean that I have to embrace them? No, not because that's what Joe jo preached about last week. We are to separate ourselves from the enemy of enemies of God. So there are several ways that the temple that we see in the Bible uh, how the temple was defiled. One way is with the money changers. Now, the money changers were actually people that were inside the temple courts, and they were making money. They were taking advantage of the people that came there to, to give offerings to the Lord. And when Jesus saw that, he was incensed. You remember, he made a whip and he cleared the temple because the temple of God was being used for an evil purpose, just like it was when Tobias... Uh, when Tobiah was allowed to, to live in there. The other thing when it comes to money, uh, we see uh, that Timothy says, the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, some people quote it as money is the root of all evil. That's not true. God uses money. The love of money is the root of all evil. And so how would that uh, be a, a way that we could defile our temple here. We could be so devoted to, to making money that we have no time for the Lord or our family. That's, that's defiling this temple, in effect, because we're misusing it. What if we're um, addicted to gambling? Once again, that, that would be a defiling of, of the temple. And uh, so anyway... The other thing that, that happened is, is, as we had read before, is that uh, the living quarters were defiled. They were defiled because Tobiah, the Ammonite, who no Ammonite should even be stepping foot in the temple, he was allowed to take up residence in there. Have we allowed something to take up residence in our temple that shouldn't be there? 1 Corinthians says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price, and that price was Jesus. Therefore glorify God in your body. Now also, uh, you, you read sometimes in the Bible about temple prostitutes. For some reason, people back in biblical times thought that having sex with prostitutes could bring you closer to the Lord. Now, there's no place in the scripture that it even comes close to that. And that actually was a a form of uh, demonic uh, worship. There were... Uh, there were different gods that you were supposed to get closer with when, when you did this. The Bible tells us, uh, don't be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And it says, such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. And so if we are allowing any of those kind of things to take up residence in our temple, we're being warned about it. And it's a pretty severe warning. And 
today because we have all of the influences from out there. We're being influenced basically to water down the gospel. We're being influenced in the in the name of tolerance to to forsake our Christian values in effect. And if we don't, we're intolerant. Well, as for me, I'd rather be intolerant because I am going to continue to listen to the Lord and I am going to continue to serve him and, and believe that his statutes are my lifeblood. There's a big price for disobedience. So finally, cleansing the defiled temple. You notice that, that what happened is, is Nehemiah took all of Tobiah's stuff and he threw it out. And, and then the temple was cleansed and purified. So how did they purify the temple? Well, they did it, number one, through the sprinkling of blood. Now, Romans 5 tells us, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, actually, I've left out a lot not to, not to make it um, too long, but if you want to read uh, Romans 5, 8, and 9, you'll see this. I, I think it's a great uh, scripture. While we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. More than having... Now, having now been justified, but much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. So the sprinkling of blood was representative. And of course, they didn't know it at that time, but it was basically representative of the blood of Christ because through his blood, we are washed. Through his blood, we are cleansed. In Ephesians 1, says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, or the forgiveness of our sins. And then in Revelation 12, it says, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And um, so the blood of the Lamb is basically what was represented there. And we know that through the blood of the Lamb that we have salvation, we have eternal life, we have forgiveness of sins. They sacrificed. Now they sacrificed, and, and you, you know about the different ways that they sacrificed, but once again, the sacrifice was for covering sin. And Jesus' sacrifice, as you know, was for covering our sin. First Peter 1 tells us that we were not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of the Lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. And it says, since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls, you have been born again, not a seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is true, the living and enduring word of God. Now, I love this because, and I think someplace up here I missed this, but, you know, when we're talking about reading the word, I love the fact that in John it says, and in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, the word was God. And then it says, if you jump down to the 14th verse, it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So part of what you're seeing there is the word. The, Jesus is synonymous with the word. So when I was, I was talking about the reading of the word, basically, you know, if you want to say, I'd like to get closer to Jesus, but I don't know how to do it. And maybe you praise, maybe you worship, maybe you pray, but you don't read your word. If you're not reading your word, you're cheating yourself. You want to get closer to him? Read your word, because he is the word. All through the New Testament, we see how Jesus is interchanged with the Word. 
because he was, is the word of God. So you, you see the sacrifice, and there's an interesting thing because in cleansing the temple, they take in two goats, and the priest puts his hand on each one and prays over them. And then one of them is sacrificed. The other one is taken out and released into the wilderness. Do you know what that one's supposed to be doing? Amen. It's called the scapegoat. He is carrying the impurities and the sin out. He's carrying them out. So what was Jesus? He was our scapegoat. He carried our sins and took them away from us. He took the sins of the world. Well, you know, Jesus uh, used a great analogy where he talked about the house swept clean. And so he was talking about the house swept clean, which is in Matthew 12. And it says, now when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through the waterless places seeking rest and it does not find it. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it unoccupied, swept and put in order. Then it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first state. That is the way it will also be with this evil generation. So the thing that Jesus is saying is, is that if you sweep your temple clean, if you cleanse yourself, if you purify yourself, and you fill it with nothing then your state is going to be worse than it was in the beginning. Okay, so what can you fill your temple with? You can fill it with the Word of God, right? And then it will stay pure, right? Hopefully. So in, uh, in conclusion, let us look at this. Just as a temple was designed to glorify God, our bodies have been, de been designed to glorify God. The scriptures give us clear direction on how to use and how not to use our bodies. When we submit our bodies as a living sacrifice, we not only please God, but we find great joy, peace, and purpose. The way we glorify God may vary according to our gifting and calling, but the way we keep our bodies holy and free from being defiled is the same. If we want to keep our bodies holy, we must fill them with praise, worship, scripture, and prayer. When we do this, we not only feel close to God and find great joy and peace in our lives, but we become an example to other believers and the unsaved. They should be able to look at us and say, I want to be like that. As we leave here today, let us be committed to glorifying God by keeping our temple holy and dedicated to God. So, would you close your eyes for a minute? So, maybe as, as we've been talking, uh, you, you've been thinking about some things that, uh, um, gee, maybe there are some areas where I need to cleanse my temple a little bit. Maybe I need to just do some purifying. Maybe I need to spend more time praying. Maybe I need to spend more time in praise and worship. Maybe I need to spend more time reading my word. And so um, if, if that hit home with you today, then um, I'd, I'd like to ask you just right now to, to give that to the Lord, to give him if there are some things that you need to give up in your life, if your temple's been filled with some of the wrong things and you need to cleanse your temple, today would be a great day to do that. And we're going to be doing communion in just a minute here. And it would be a nice time to be able to do communion and say, I, uh, I've i cleansed the temple. I've purified the temple. And I'm making a new commitment today. 
Father, we, we ask that you would forgive us for the ways that we have defiled the temple. You know what those are, and we know what those are. And so, Father, we ask today that you would help us to just recommit ourselves to cleansing and purifying our temple, to filling our temple with your Holy Spirit, to be overflowing with that, to fill it with praise and worship, to fill it with prayer, to fill it with, with your word, and to fill, fill it with dedication and glory to you. We ask, Father, that you would take our temples, our lives, Lord, and that you would use them to glorify you. You would use them to further your gospel. We ask, Lord, that um, I, I'm reminded of what St. Francis of Assisi said when he said, wherever you go, minister the gospel, and whenever necessary, use words. Father, we ask that it wouldn't be so much what we speak, but what we live that would speak of you, that, that would glorify you, that we would be lights in a dark world, and people would look at us and say, there's something different about him, and I want to be more like him. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of your Son, for the blood of Jesus, and for our salvation. We ask that you would bless all this now. In Jesus' name, amen.